Christmas. Welcome. Let's begin our worship and sing in Oh Come All You Faithful. Let's stand together and sing. Welcome, church. Uh, it's good to be with you just after Christmas. Um, we have a great time worshiping with you on Christmas Eve, and um, it's a joy to be back the day after Christmas and to come together as a church and to continue to offer our praises uh, and to sit in the midst of a holy season such as this for, uh, for Christmas. And so we thank you for being here, whether you're joining us online um, or, or in person. We're so grateful to have you here, and we'll continue our worship and singing. Joy to the world. Thanks. 
now let's affirm our faith together. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried. The third day he rose from the dead, he ascended into heaven, and sitteth at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From hence he shall come to judge the quick and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Before we bow and pray together, I want to celebrate some great ministry over the season of Advent. 
Um, many of you participated in, in our angel tree where we uh, dedicated gifts to a number of seniors living in the facilities just across the road at Midtown and also at Legacy Oaks. And uh, over the course of Advent, in just a couple weeks, we sponsored over 100 shut-ins and those living in assisted living. And so um, that's a wonderful thing to celebrate. And, and that was a little bit of a departure this year from what we uh, historically done, which was usually sponsoring children in Midlothian. But what we found was that uh, the children had already had a lot of support from churches and, and organizations in the community. And so we began looking for those who might easily be missed in a season like this. And, and we began to see the need for, for those uh, who are often not thought of there in assisted living uh, or rehab facilities. And so I want to thank you for great ministry. We've already begun relationship over with Midtown. We have a weekly worship service over there. And so we've got a great relationship with the residents there. And this has actually paved the way for us to build relationship at Legacy Oaks. And they've invited us to come in and bring worship to them as well that we'll be looking at in the new year. So uh, what a wonderful thing to begin to work and build relationships in our community. You know, as a church, there's, there's an unlimited resource of things that we can do, but, but I think the things that have the most impact is not when we just do a good thing and leave it behind, but when we can do a great thing and use it to build relationships for the glory of God, uh, relationships where we can continue to minister and show the grace of God to people, and this is one of those. Uh, it's opened a doorway, and so uh, praise God, and we'll see where the Lord takes it in the next year, um, but you might prayerfully consider being a part of that ministry as well. Um, Let's go ahead and, and bow in prayer together. Jesus, we come to you on the heels of a, a holy season in which we are reminded that you chose to come to us. In the midst of a world that is broken, a world that many of us find, find reason to want to escape, you compelled by the love you have toward your creation, even in our brokenness, chose to come and enter into the suffering, knowing that you wouldn't be above the fray, knowing that you yourself would feel the sword upon you at a time in your life you chose to come and to give your life. John says, so that all who believe might become children of God. We thank you, Jesus, that you display the courage of a shepherd who's come to care for his flock, who's come to stand as the gateway, to stand in harm's way, so that we might find rescue and find life in you. Indeed, you are worthy to be praised. And we count it an honor to come back into this space and to lift high your great name. And we pray that, that our worship wouldn't just be bound to songs. That our worship wouldn't be defined by sitting in a pew and, and listening to the word. But instead that we might be a people whose hearts are open to you. Who take these messages from the songs and the word and we allow them to shape us and to allow your grace to change us so that we can become an embodiment of who you are. Though we will never attain your perfection, but by the grace of God, we continue to move toward your likeness. Praying that you through the Holy Spirit might shape our character that our life might begin to reflect more and more the fruit of the Spirit, showing a world what kindness, faithfulness, love, compassion truly looks like. We pray you would birth something in us, a new movement in us, because of this season that we have so faithfully observed. Call us into deeper commitment in this year to come. Help us, God, to step out in faith. Not to settle for, for the places where we're comfortable, but instead and to venture out, Jesus, as you have modeled for us. To maybe step in harm's way, so to speak, that another person might come to know the 
the power of your love and what it means to be a child of God. We pray in this new year that you would challenge us, that you would call us to give more, to draw into you more, that we might see more of you. This prayer we make is a prayer to seek your face, a prayer to honor you. And so we look to your example, we look to your teaching as a way of life, a a new and glorious and different way of life. And we turn our attention now to the way in which you taught us to pray, Jesus. And we pray this not because it's some magical prayer, but it's a way of us understanding how we can pursue you and how we can seek you in prayer. And so we're mindful and we share these words together as the church. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. And give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Amen. Our scripture lesson today comes from Matthew chapter 2, verses 13 through 23. If you have your Bible, you're welcome to turn there with us. Um, This passage of scripture is known as both Jesus' escape to Egypt and the story of the loss of innocence. And if you're familiar with it, you're probably thinking, great choice today, Brady. Um, Man, Nothing more we love to hear than the story of a loss of life of, of many um, young children. But um, I would like to, to be courageous and to stand into this by blaming the lectionary. So, uh, you know, the lectionary, which is a historic set of texts that kind of help you walk through the scriptures in their entirety of the course of three years. Um, some preachers stick to that every week um, because you do. You get to work through the Old Testament, the prophets, and the New Testament. Um, and, and we don't typically do that here, but there are many benefits to the lectionary. Is one that you get to deal with the passages of Scripture that you don't want to deal with. Uh, and one of the downsides of the lectionary is that, well, sometimes you have to deal with stories in the Scripture you don't want to deal with. And so uh, this really might be one of those. I just thought we'd do the lectionary today because I don't know what to preach on the day after Christmas. And, and um, here we are in this story. So um, it's a tough one, but, but I want to offer to us that There's hope to be found in this. And and this is, for us, a stark reminder of the world to which Jesus was born into. We may not choose to have to sit in this story, but, but it's here for a reason. And, And we're reminded that Jesus came into a broken world and was subject to the same things that we and many people around the world face in the form of suffering, even from the beginning. And yet we will see in the life of Jesus, even in the very beginning of his life and in the very beginning of Scripture, everything points to what he will come to do. The entire word is an is a arc of, of the narrative of salvation that Jesus brings. We'll see this here in our story today. And so for that, even though this is a hard story, there is great hope. Beginning in verse 13, when they had gone, an angel, they meaning the Magi, had gone, an angel of the Lord appeared to Joseph in a dream. Get up, he said. Take the child and his mother and escape to Egypt. Stay there until I tell you, for Herod is going to search for the child to kill him. So he got up, took the child and his mother during the night and left for Egypt, where he stayed until the death of Herod. And so was fulfilled what the Lord had said through the prophet, Out of Egypt I called my son. When Herod realized that he had been outwitted by the Magi, he was furious and he gave orders to kill all the boys in Bethlehem and its vicinity who were two years old and under. 
in accordance with the time he had learned from the Magi. Then what was said through the prophet Jeremiah was fulfilled. A voice is heard in Ramah, weeping in great mourning. Rachel weeping for her children, refusing to be comforted because they are no more. After Herod died, an angel of the Lord appeared in a dream to Joseph in Egypt and said, Get up, take the child and his mother, and go to the land of Israel, for those who were trying to take the child's life are dead. So he got up, took the child and his mother, and went to the land of Israel. And when he heard that Archelaus was reigning in Judea, in the place of his father Herod, he was afraid to go there. Having been warned in another dream, he withdrew to the district of Galilee, and he went and lived in a town called Nazareth. So was fulfilled what was said through the prophets, that he would be called a Nazarene. The word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. I tried to warn you, it was a sobering story um, indeed, but, but truly a reminder of the broken world into which Jesus chose to enter. And we see this at the very beginning of his life. I mean, Jesus, who had just been born maybe a year or two max from his birth, even before he is able to speak, he's already, already a threat to those in power. Before he's even able to walk, we see Jesus fleeing for his life as a refugee. This is the scripture story of, of Jesus at the very beginning of his life. You know, just for context in the story, as we come up to this one, we see that, that the Magi, the wise men, had been following a star to come and welcome the king born unto the Jews. They come from a distant land and they arrive in Jerusalem hoping to find some sort of celebration. And when a king was born, usually the festivities lasted for quite some time. So it's likely that they came bearing gifts expecting to be a part of the party. But they come and they find none. And so they go to the place where you might assume a king would be born. They go to the palace to King Herod to come and welcome this one who would be his future successor. Only the news of this child startles Herod and startles all the people and for good reason. Herod was a a treacherous figure as we see in history. Someone who is capable of cruelty beyond which many people in the ancient world, rulers even, were were capable of. And and so Herod, finding out that there's a threat, pledges to to join the Magi in their worship of the king if they could just find him and let him know where he was. But Herod had no, no interest in worshiping this one born king of the Jews. He was more interested in eliminating the competition. You know, King Herod is, is really, when you look at the scope of history, especially around this time, one of the more interesting characters that we see. Herod's political career began when his dad appointed him as a governor of Galilee. And it was there, as he spent time with Julius Caesar and Mark Antony, that they became fast friends. And as Herod began to accumulate power, it was in 44 B.C. that that Julius Caesar was assassinated. And and it was at this time that, in his wills, Julius Caesar had left everything to his adopted son, Octavian. And, And Octavian and Mark Antony joined forces and Herod with them to take on Julius Caesar's assassins. And after about a year of fighting, they they wiped all of them out. But, but not long after that, Octavian and Mark Antony had quite a falling out. And this might be the part of the story that, that catches your ear. Mark Antony, who had been married to Octavian's sister, divorced her and left her for Cleopatra. Oh, yeah, well, Octavian wasn't too excited about that. Uh, and with the power of Julius Caesar at stake, Octavian and Mark Antony wage war against each other, knowing that the one who comes out will likely take rule as Caesar. 
Uh, and, and so they go to war, go toe-to-toe -to -toe against each other, but it puts Herod at this kind of unique point, having been friends with both Octavian and Mark Antony at this point. And so he has to choose. And so Herod chooses Mark Antony. It becomes a, a, a general in Mark Antony's um, army, and they begin to go and fight against Octavian and his forces. Now, if you're familiar with the history story, you know that uh, Herod, well, he chose poorly. <laughs> um, Octavian defeated Mark Antony at Actium. And, and, of course, Mark Antony and Cleopatra with their famous ending uh, that we know. But it was at this point, after Octavian had largely won the battle, that he began to recess uh, to a place, to an island um, off of Italy, to try and gather what he was going to do to hunt down all of those who were going to, who have fought against him with Mark Antony. Uh, and this is the part of the story that's, that's truly fascinating because it's here that Herod, one of those that, that Octavian was looking to track down and kill, um, does the unthinkable. Uh, as the story goes, Octavian is there with his generals in the room planning how they're going to hunt down Herod and kill him, that Herod walks through the doors of where they were meeting. And, and everyone stood there speechless as Herod walks up to Octavian and he bows down on one knee and he says, Octavian, you know that I fought against you. I fought battles against your armies. I killed your men. I fought alongside Mark Antony to the very end. And as I was faithful to him, so I will be faithful to you. And he took Octavian's hand and he kissed his hand. <laughs> Octavian was so blown away by this, uh, so enamored with his courage, that he actually appointed him as ruler of Palestine. Uh, gave him a place to, to rule as his own. And this is where we find Herod in the story, in the midst of a 32-year reign over Palestine. And Herod was, was an, actually a, a, I mean, a fairly significant ruler in the way that, that he built magnificent structures, even you know, doubled the size of the temple. And if you go to the Holy Land today, you'll see remnants of and even some of those structures that Herod was responsible for building. But he did so on the backs of the people, heavily taxing the people of the region and the people hated him for it, not only for the taxation that he had upon them, but for his cruelty in the way in which he ruled. Though there wasn't a lot of external fighting during his reign, um, it was because Herod was so feared by all the people. In fact, Herod, towards the end of his life, began to be so, um, I guess, nervous and so fearful of someone taking his power that he would do things that, that history would not think so well of him for. Out of his paranoia, by the end of his life, Herod would kill three of his sons, his wife, and almost her entire family in order to preserve his throne. So it's no wonder that when they hear the news of one born king of the Jews, the position occupied by Herod, that the people grew very, very nervous. And Herod, who was already in the mode of protecting his throne at all costs, takes note to find the child and kill him. Only we find that Joseph is warned by an angel in a dream to flee to Egypt. And we see this kind of ironic reversal of the Exodus story. Remember in the book of Exodus when God re rescues his people out of Egypt to bring them to the promised land. We find the son of God being rescued by his father to send him out of the promised land into Egypt. And once Herod realizes that he's been duped by the Magi, he orders the killings of all the children, two years of age, all the boys, two years of age and younger, in the area of Bethlehem. 
thinking of the size of the population we know of Bethlehem at that time, you're looking at a couple hundred, maybe 300 children. And it's a horrific part of the story. I mean, one of the most gruesome scenes we see in the Gospels themselves. And it sure kills the buzz of the wonder of Christmas Eve that some of us are still riding the coattails of today. But actually within this story, there's an incredible promise of hope. And the hope is tucked away in verse 18. When when Matthew points to a prophecy from Jeremiah. And the prophecy from Jeremiah is this. It says, A voice is heard in Ramah, weeping in great mourning. Rachel weeping for her children and refusing to be comforted because they are no more. Now the passage itself may not sound very hopeful and it really isn't so much at this point. But what it is, is this prophecy is a reminder of a story that took place all the way in Genesis chapter 35. And the story is with Jacob and his wife Rachel. Jacob, one of the the forefathers and ancestors of the faith. The one recipient of the promise of God and the one that God promises to make a great nation out of. Jacob, whose name is Israel, who had become the people of God. He's married to Leah and Rachel. And Rachel, his wife, bears two sons for him, Joseph and their youngest son. Now, at the birth of their youngest son, Rachel has great distress and trouble during the, pregnant, during the birth. And as a consequence, would die. And we're told in Genesis 35, with her last breath, she names her son Ben-Oni, which means son of my sorrow. Now, Jacob, who was left to care for their children, must have not thought this to be a very fitting name for his child. And so after her death, he renames him Ben Jamin, Benjamin, which means son at my right hand. So here in Genesis 35, we have one child with two names son of my sorrows and son at my right hand. Now, what's interesting about this is that the Holy Family probably weren't clued into this at this point. And we know Jeremiah and we know the writer of Genesis and Jacob had no idea at this point. But this scene here, this one child with two names, will foreshadow the, the dual ministry of Jesus as a son of sorrows and the son who sits at the right hand. As the son of sorrow and the son of victory. As the son who would come to suffer and the son who would hold and possess the glory of God. The son who would endure pain, but the son who would also gain immeasurable power. the very beginning of Jesus' life, we have a story that we would rather forget. But even in this story, there is a pointing to the hope that is possessed in Jesus himself and what he'll come to accomplish for this world. Of a Jesus who will come to embrace and enter into the suffering of the world. That though he comes as the son of God, does not consider himself one to rise above or to be elevated above the suffering, but chooses to embrace that suffering, to experience it himself. Only to be vindicated and elevated to the right hand of God. A place where he would rule with power and authority. And this Jesus, who would come to us so long ago that we celebrate every Advent, will come again. It's the 
part of Advent we always miss. Always think of Advent as looking back to when Jesus came. But the great hope of Advent is that we know that Jesus is coming again. And he will enter into a broken world. But when Jesus takes his seat as the ruler over this world, or the son at the right hand, the stories that we would rather forget, the tragedies that break our hearts and bring tears to our eyes will be no more. For he will sit in glory, he will sit in authority over all creation, in all of this broken world, all the wrong things that we grieve will be made right again under his care. And this is the hope of Advent. This is the hope that we look forward to. It's the hope the early church sat in. That's why the prophecy they recall over and over again in the book of Acts is that Jesus is sitting at the right hand of God, which means that the suffering we experience will be no more when he comes again to establish his reign. And so we, in the midst of a broken world, subject ourselves to the suffering and to tragedies like these. Find hope not only in the one who came to us long ago, but who will come and will reign in glory and authority and power over a world that has been redeemed. This is the hope of Advent. Would you join me in praying? Jesus, we are humbled. It almost seems unthinkable that you would choose to be a son of suffering. It makes sense that the Son of God would be the Son at the right hand, but the Son of suffering, that's still hard for us to fathom. That you would come to us in the form of a child, a child who would embody every hope of heaven and hope on earth, be subject to suffering and threats of death even at such a young age, and for those threats to be made good later in your life. But it is in giving your life that your power is displayed where you're taken up from the grave and given victory over death. And that you, by your grace, share that victory over death with all of those who come to you and throw themselves upon you to call you Lord and Savior. We know that because of you, we are given victory. That we have reason for hope here and today. Not just a hope that has been or a hope that will be, but a hope here and now. Because we know the way the story ends. It ends with you sitting at the right hand in glory over a world that has been redeemed and reconciled unto you. Where the tears will be wiped away, where the stories of tragedies and brokenness won't even be memories that we hold of a world that used to be. They will vanish from our thoughts. And we'll never have to stand over the grave of someone that we loved. We'll never experience the feelings of loss or hurt or pain. There will only be joys and glories untold in your presence. How we thank you for the invitation to experience such a day And we begin to cast our eyes to that day. Not to escape the present day that we are called to live in. But as a way to keep one hand firmly holding on to that hope. So that we can live and enter this day 
whether we're living in the joys of this world or the sorrows of this world, that we can endure it with hope, knowing who you are and what you will do. We pray to be filled with this hope through the power of your Holy Spirit today, that we can step into it with courage. For this we pray in your name and in your honor. Amen. Church, let us stand and sing. Good Christian friends, rejoice. Good Christian friends, rejoice with heart and soul and voice. Give me to what we say. News, news, Jesus Christ is born today. As we continue our worship, we have the opportunity to give our, our gifts to the Lord, to continue to do great ministry through the church. As a body of Christ, we are called to gather together to embody the heart of God in mission to the world, uh, to make disciples of Jesus Christ for the transformation of that world. And so part of that is giving of ourselves. And so you have an opportunity to make a financial gift uh, as you leave. There are plates at every point of exit here from the church, and also if you're online, uh, you can follow the QR code or the link in the comment section to make a gift. Um, if you might be hearing in the next couple days, you might have gotten an email already, I'm trying to remember the timeline, uh, but we are changing our on the platform for our online giving. So if you do give regularly online, we continue to encourage you to do so, but you will need to change over the information. Uh, the reason for doing that is one, that the rates that we'll be paying for gifts, will, uh, for any financial gifts that are given will be much cheaper. So it's going to save the church money. We used to uh, have just a couple thousand dollars in, in charges a year, and now we're like 10,000 because we have so much coming in. And so this will bring it down significantly. And so we're changing that platform. It also integrates with all of our, our new systems. So um, please, it would be a little bit of an inconvenience, but if you work with us on that, that would be a great thing to do. Um, but we thank you and appreciate your gifts and look forward to many great new ministries that will, God will give birth to in the year to come. And so uh, just a couple of announcements to hold in front of you. One of those is next Sunday we're having two worship services. So we'll have the 830 in here, uh, traditional worship, and then we will combine our two 11 o'clock services over in the Family Life Center for Contemporary Worship. Uh, so I encourage you. We know these next this Sunday and the next Sunday are people are kind of all around and about, and so we're uh, dealing with reduced staff and our our sound and AV and and preachers and all kinds of things. So uh, you know we're just going to kind of work with it for another Sunday. Um, and I do want to give a shout out to our our AV and sound folks. They have been just awesome, um, especially dealing with some last minute changes. Um, if you like singing songs and be able to read what the words are, then uh, you'll know that and hear what um, is being sung and the pastor's um, preaching, then, um, man, you know it happens because of them and so their dedication. So we're certainly grateful for that. Um, but, yeah, we look forward to, to what's to come. We know there's one thing. I'm just going to say something real quick about it um, for you to be thinking about. But we have coming up on January 16th, we're going to have a birthday for another church. Um, and uh, one church who actually began their ministry with us uh, 15 years ago uh, in the Family Life Center uh, actually got their start with a lot of help from our church. We had AV people, and John and Pam Lowe helped them on a regular basis to get their start out of us. And 15 years ago, God's been working in this church ever since. 
and, and they're building facilities out on 1387 right now, but their birthday is going to be the beginning of January, and they have no place to celebrate. So I said, hey, let's throw y'all a birthday party together. And so we're going to have some food together, a little bit of worship, and I want to encourage you to come because it's just going to be a time to blend our congregations, get to know some people in Midlothian you may not know, and just celebrate what God has done through the body of Christ because they're not our competition. They're our brothers and sisters in Jesus. And so um, it's just going to be a fun day of just practicing the grace of God together and showing the love of Christ. So uh, be thinking about that January 16th. It's going to be a great day. And so I'll probably be asking for your help to cook food and serve. So uh, just be thinking about that. But it's going to be a lot of fun. Um, you know, I, we get to leave this place with hope. Uh, what a great thing to hold to in the midst of a world in which we live in. To know that ours is one of hope. To know that because of Jesus, the joy that we experience will be the end of our story. It always wins under Christ and his reign and his rule. We look to this one who is both the son of sorrows and the son at the right hand, and we place our hope in him forevermore. May you be blessed as we go. Amen.